Fred D'Angelo, if I haven't met you, I'd like to meet you throughout the course of the day today. Um, I have with me a good friend of ours, Zach. Zach is, yes, Zach is joining us from Makaweli Ranch. You've all kind of heard of the whole grass-fed movement, which is, it's the way, you know, nature really intended the beef to be anyway. They've got the grass-fed beef, okay? 100% grass-fed. They're also bringing in venison from Maui, which is fantastic as well. Um, and the nice thing too about the venison and uh, the eland, which we're gonna be talking about as well, um, is that it is, the Elan were uh, acquired by uh, Molokai Ranch in the 90s. Um, they were originally brought over kind of for safari hunting. And uh, once Molokai Ranch started to kind of uh, transition away from their current business model, there was an opportunity to purchase these animals. I think at the time, maybe they purchased about 40 Elan. Uh, they purchased some Onyx as well. Onihau would do uh, organized hunts. So they'd bring people out, drop them off to a certain part of the island, and then they'd be able to hunt uh, these exotic animals. Um, but that was only really in small scale, so... Like safari style? Yeah, safari style. Kind of thing. So after about 20 years, the population of Elan went from, you know, say your, your 40 animals were over 2,000 Elan on the island right now. So in looking at this program and in looking at like the, the Maui uh, Wild Harvest Venison program, it's a bit of a wildlife management um, program as well. Um, rather than letting the animals, you know, completely uh, roam free and then you know on Maui the access here there's over a hundred thousand so uh, you know being able to process and utilize these animals I mean it's some of the cleanest meat in the world and the flavors are incredible so um, really it was just a chance for us to come in um, you know be part of this wildlife management program and uh, you know start harvesting so uh, with a direct benefit to the island of Miki as well yeah yeah so it, it, it keeps uh, the the, um, the residents of the island employed this is Aniha which is primarily Native yeah, there's Hawaiian. about 120 native Hawaiians on the island, so... Are they all 120, 100% Hawaiian? 100% Hawaiian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what, that's, and that's like, that's the ones that are left, right? Yeah, so. and you can't enter the village. I mean, it's on a separate part of the island. Um, you know, it's all basically subsistence Was living. It? So, um, the sheep programs that we do there, we, uh, we, we, we barge over about 200 heads of sheep uh, every month. And from Nihau? From Nihau as well. To Kauai? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a big World War II landing craft. Every Wednesday, it'll um, you know beach itself kind of on the southwest side of the island, southeast actually, and uh, they'll just herd up. Basically, it's wild lamb. They come down to a watering hole. Uh, they'll herd them up, and then they'll bring them over, and it's probably an eight-hour trip uh, for the sheep. They'll spend uh, one night at our facility, and then we process them the next uh, next day. So that's a really unique program also. Wow. And, and what are you doing with that after you process the sheep? Uh, yeah, we sell it to restaurants also. Our Moving forward, I'm going to split the group. I need our grill, grill battalion in the back, and I'm going to keep our uh, our prep team up front. We're going to go over the seasoning part. The the gentlemen right now are going to be starting the seasoning. So. Um, we've got two guys that run broil. We've got the dropper. This is the guy who would be doing this, seasoning, basting, dropping him for our, our, our bus driver, who's Mo. Um, and Mo is the finisher. So it goes into the broiler. He's cross-checking our chits, checking temps, checking counts, where the temps at. And one of the most important things that he's doing, ins ensuring proper resting. All right, why do we rest the steak? Ensuring that the moisture that is inherent in that steak is not lost through the cooking process. When you think about anything with cooking, right, even if you bake, you're, you're, you're roasting a prime rib, what are you doing? You're, you're forcing all that heat from all areas, the grill, heat, right? Forcing all the moisture that's inside that steak right to the middle. When you rest it, you let that steak rest from... Um, and again, if you're temping your steak, you can't let that, you know, you're, we're not taking it right to temp, right at the order, all right? A fire pickup, even if we have like a, you know, usually you order a salad, you have an appetizer, right? We start your steak then, and we take it to about three quarter way, rest it, then we finish, and then we serve. Anybody know what also buco, the word means? Slow cooked? It's a good guess. Buco is bone. Is it? I thought you said it was like the neck bone. Kind of thing. No, the osobuco is actually the foreshank, right? Okay. It's the foreshank of the veal. 
and it's actually a marrow bone, right? So the beauty of an osobuco being veal um, is that you also get the bone marrow. So in Italian, osobuco, hole in the bone. Hole in the bone. So that way you can enjoy the marrow. That's all that osobuco means, right? And then I kind of gave you like a little fake osobuco because we tied that one bone around the short rib. I gave you the look without the marrow, but that's just what it is. So when you get a whole tenderloin, which you can actually purchase either at like Costco or something, all of the fat, silver skin and um, such that's already on it, try and take that off with your hands first because in that way it limits how much meat you'll lose. So it comes really it comes right off so you can see. And then if there's some pieces that kind of like stay on, you just leave it on because then once you get to that point with your knife, it'll come off nice and easy. Pretty much comes, everything comes right off. For this, since it's so small, what I like to do is just use a paring knife. So then with the, with the silver skin that's left, you basically just make a little incision right there at the end. That way you can hold it and then you follow that silver skin up, uh, just takes off the silver skin. What I'm doing right here with the tenderloin is just dicing it up. So with the tartare, um, that's really all it is. You're gonna take raw diced beef and you're gonna um, include, I have Dijon mustard. Um, we also have some olive oil. Um, some sriracha, Tabasco, uh, Worcestershire as well, some chives, and I've also got capers. The Worcestershire gives it a more rounder flavor. I just put a little bit, and you have to watch that as well. Anything dark will then color your meat as well too, right? So even if you're making like a poke, something like that, you, you wanna watch how much of you know, the soy you wanna put into it because it'll just discolor, right? I've got some onion, and there's different cuts you can use too. So with the tenderloin, um, hardly any marbling, right? So that's why it's called the tenderloin. It, it's very moist, it's very, uh, it's very tender. Um, you've got a lot more, uh, there's more fat through a strip loin and you've also got a different texture. It's more of a mouthfeel. You've got more of a bite to that. Um, and so even mixing the two together um, is also real good too, right? I got some salt. Um, I've got all of the different ingredients that we've mixed and the olive oil is just gonna bring it all together. So then you just mix it. Okay, put that together. And you can just go ahead and pop it in a mold, which is a little easier. And then you just wanna let it sit there for a little bit. You don't wanna take that ring mold out quite yet. What we're gonna to top it off with, just to give it a bit more richness, is a quail egg. Now the quail eggs, you could use a regular egg. You can even get the peewee eggs up from the egg farm in Wahiwa which is really good too, super, super good. Um, but the fun thing about the quail eggs is really the size. So it's a perfect size. The shell you'll notice is a bit on the, gosh, I don't want, it's, it's not, it doesn't crack very, it's almost leathery. So what you wanna do is use a knife. So a very sharp paring knife, make an incision, and then you actually kinda cut the crack open, um, at which point, once you crack it, the little trick would be to leave it that way so most of the white kind of comes out. And then what you have left with is just the yolk. You're gonna make a little indention right in the middle so when it falls in there, it ain't gonna roll off. Then you take it off and voila. All right, we're just gonna dress the plate. Just put a little bit of olive oil. If I had some lava salt, that'd be nice because it adds that color you know, just that color component to the plate. Go ahead and pop on. You can, you can dress your arugula. Touch of oil, touch of lemon, touch of salt. But I like the crispness of the, and the peppery of the, of the arugula, just nice and raw. And that's it, one, two, three. Our venison tartare. So what do you think, Trent? Okay. Oh, so is it like... Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.